afternoon, everybody. I'm Fiona Di Domenico, Regional President for Castle Group, and broadcasting uh, today from our Sarasota office. So, for all of our local Sarasota people that are um, on the call today, thanks for joining. And for those of you that may not be familiar with Castle, um, we are a Florida based firm, and we have offices uh, right across the state of Florida and also in Texas. So, if we have anybody from Texas, welcome. And Castle is a little bit unique in the industry in that we specialize um, in associations where we can put at least one team member on site. A lot of our associations would be um, what we call amenitized associations. So they would have possibly be gated, they may have tennis, pickleball, you know, lifestyle. Um, a lot of them have food and beverage and we've got um, specialty departments within Castle. Uh, that work to handle and give expertise uh, to our boards on all of those things. So um, we look forward to chatting today. We've got uh, Aaron who has uh, donated his time. So thanks for being here. Aaron, would you like to tell us a little bit about you and your firm? Absolutely. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we, uh, before we go ahead and get, and get started on the program, I'll tell you about myself. I'm a board certified condominium and plan development attorney. Um, I'm coming to you live from Tampa, Florida. Um, our firm focuses on providing uh, services to condos and homeowners associations. That's all we do. Um, from handling legal opinions, amending governing documents, of course, um, and uh, dealing with uh, collection enforcement matters, um, and, and general representation to assist all of uh, your communities um, with, with issues as they arise. Um, and I'm happy to be here today. Thanks for having me, Fiona. Excellent. And, and as uh, Shauna had mentioned, um, feel free, we're going to go through, I think you've got uh, some PowerPoint slides, Aaron. We're going to talk about all of, the, uh, all of the issues that come up when you're trying to update and perhaps make changes to your documents. Okay. Uh, but please feel free to chat in your, um, your questions as we go. I also have some questions that some people sent in ahead of time, which is great. And we will uh, try to pepper those in um, at the appropriate time. So I'll turn it back over to you and take us away. Okay, great. Um, so we can go to the next slide because I've gone through that. Um, I wouldn't be a lawyer without a disclaimer at the beginning of the representation, of course. So <laughs> of I know course. that, of course. So I know that most of the communities who are attending, most board members who are attending now, you have your own counsel. This is not legal advice. It's not a substitute for advice from your own counsel. Please don't go and try to draft your own documents, uh, document amendments and get them recorded. Um, talk to your own counsel about it. Um, and um, it, it's, it's important to understand that this is, you know, not necessarily legal advice because everything is very specific to, to your community. But we'll talk from the 30,000 foot view that will give you some, some good information, some good nuggets to take, to take back and to hopefully utilize within your community. So we can go on. Aaron, Aaron, we do have um, just some people chatting in already saying that they're with a co-op. So as we go through, I, I think you have in your presentation, but maybe some of the things that might um, specifically have to deal with a co-op versus a condo as well. Okay, yeah, and, and we'll touch on that briefly. I know most folks here are with a condominium or homeowners association, a lot of the amendments could potentially apply to a co-op, but the amendment procedures will be different based on the proprietary lease documents that, that they have um, and the statute that will govern. Um, but before we dig into the substantive as aspect of the amendments and, um, and, and uh, the different areas within which you can amend, there are there's something I want to point out from that 30,000 foot view, and that's the federal and the state laws. Um, it's important to consider that there are limitations on amendments. You can't just amend everything. Um, from the Fair Housing Act, uh, we know that we've dealt with issues with um, restricting um, animals within communities. The Fair Housing Act may require you to give a reasonable accommodation to people with a disability. Housings for older persons can restrict based on age, but other communities that are not considered a quote unquote housing for older persons can't. Um, there's also amendments you may wanna be cautious about if you're going to limit uh, the, the use of amenities by minors. There are certain ages that may be appropriate. And those are the kinds of things that you wanna make sure that you're in compliance with federal law, not just what the wishes are of the association. Um, satellite dishes, you can't prohibit um, certain types of satellite dishes um, and uh, an antenna within community. 
uh, within communities. You can impose certain limitations on location and size, provided you're following the Telecommunications Act of 1966. Um, and that's something that we can guide you uh, along as well. And in Florida, um, before we move to the next slide, there's also the renewable energy that is uh, you're dealing with um, one, section 163.04 that talks about solar collectors, clotheslines, uh, et cetera, that you don't want to prohibit all solar collectors, all solar panels, because that would be a violation of Florida state law. Um, so now we'll talk about permissive versus mandatory statutes. If you live in a condo, you're very familiar with the fact that chapter 718 governs your election procedure. You cannot deviate from the election procedure with uh, information within your bylaws um, and amend your bylaws to do away with the two envelope system. That's a mandatory statute, by example, within the, the condo statute that you need to follow. However, there's a lot of sections within both chapter 718, 719 for co-ops and chapter 720 for HOAs that have the italicized language, unless otherwise <clears throat> provided within your governing documents. So whenever you see that language, the governing documents can be more lenient or, or more strict than the statute. A good example would be the 48 hour notice requirement for a board meeting. Both within chapter 718 and chapter 720, it says 48 hours, unless the governing documents provide otherwise. So a lot of associations will have a three day requirement or five day requirement. So it's important to look within your documents and to determine what's permissive versus mandatory as part of an amendment project. Let me go on to the, uh, the next slide. The, and this is what we were talking about briefly with co-ops. When you're dealing with a condominium, I know everyone on this call is familiar with this, but just to give us uh, the, uh, the foundation, condominiums, you're talking about a declaration of condominium. There's articles, there's bylaws, there's rules. All of these documents can be amended. With the HOA, you're talking about typically declarations of covenants and restrictions. And with a co-op, you have a proprietary lease and you have shares within the corporation. Uh, it's a little bit different, but the amendments that we're gonna talk about in theory should be able to be made for the most part <clears throat> to your co-op, especially amendments to use restrictions, et cetera. Within your governing documents and governing documents is a defined term within, within, uh, within the statutes, you have different documents. Now, the pyramid shows the declaration at the top is the smallest section. However, it's the most important. It, if you were looking at, uh, at uh, US uh, federal law, this would be the United States constitution. It would be at the very top. Your declaration is like the constitution. Below it, follow the articles, bylaws, and rules. If there's any conflict within the documents, this is the hierarchy that you look to to see which one controls. And that's why whenever you're preparing amendments, you wanna make sure that you ensure consistency across all of the documents, um, that you don't have language in your bylaws that are going to be inconsistent with the declaration because then the declaration is going to control anyway. So a lot of times it requires um, a, a, a complete and total review of the documents to determine what amendments would be appropriate. And Aaron, we've got a couple of questions kind of around the process. This might be a good time to, sure. um, to try to address some of those. So I'm gonna kind of put them all together into, into a, a couple of questions here. So the first one is we've got a couple of people that are saying, hey, you know, we've got 48 amendments that we need to do. Um, should we just be rewriting, you know, our entire documents? That's one part of the question. And the other one that I see coming in is where does, in your opinion, a committee fit in in here? Because obviously it needs to go to the attorney, but it, do you see that most um, associations have a committee that work on rewriting the documents? Maybe speak to a little bit of that. Okay. Um, first, I'll talk about the process and procedure in, in connection with amendments, and that will uh, we'll, we'll touch on the committee as well. Um, it depends on what your community wants and or needs. A lot of communities, if I get involved and the association retains me and I see that they have 32 amendments, 10 of which deal with just one provision over the past 30 years, what I am going to recommend to them is let's put together an amended and restated set of documents. Let's take all of the amendments you've done in the past, have them taken to a word processor, 
put in all of the amendments and you start with amendment one, change it, amendment two, change it how, however you end up, and then look and see what your current documents currently, uh, currently call for, what your existing documents call for. Because as an attorney, if I'm looking at a set of documents and I have to go through 15 amendments every time a question is asked, it becomes expensive and burdensome for even uh, owners and people, uh, prospective purchasers that want to know what use restrictions, what procedures exist within the community. So a lot of times when you see that there are a lot of amendments, I'll recommend that you do an amended and restated set, which will essentially create a brand new document. You'll show underlines and strike throughs within the document as you're preparing it. And then the final version that would be recorded would be a quote unquote clean copy where all the underlines would be incorporated, the strike through is removed after the membership approves it. Uh, if you have one particular area that is a problem for your community right now and you want to take care of that immediately, then that's something that would that can happen much faster, typically. Um, and it is easier for owners to digest. Um, a lot of times I will recommend that clients follow, if they haven't amended their documents uh, ever, and they're 30 years old and it requires 80% of owners to approve any amendments. Yes. Then <laughs> that what I recommend first is before you spend a lot of money having me draft something that may look great, but never gets approved, let's spend a little bit of time and a little bit of money preparing amendments to the amendment procedures first. Instead so of- it easier to adopt those amendments essentially. Exactly, and that's what this slide is talking about that, and this is the statutory default, but let's say it takes two thirds of all owners to approve an, an amendment we could change the amendment procedure to, to, to say two thirds of those that participate in person or by proxy can adopt amendments. What that does is it changes people who fail to vote from, it changes their failure to vote from being an automatic no. So, and a lot of, I get a, a lot of questions, well, our community is not gonna trust us. They're gonna say, we're just trying to take over and make change, a lot of changes with only a few people participating. And the simple response to a comment like that is, listen, if 100% of the owners vote, depending on how you drafted the amendment, there's been no change whatsoever. But we're not going to reward apathy as making it count as a negative vote. Yeah. Um, because if, if the amendments get adopted, the amendment to the amendment procedures get adopted, then you know that you can get members to work on the larger changes. And that's where the committee would come in. If you're going to be going and making huge changes to documents where you're going to need essentially people to pound the pavement, to get out there and to get proxy signed and get people to approve your amendments, you want to get owners involved if you can to number one, they could, they could serve on a committee, a document amendment committee to review the documents uh, recommend changes, make a list of changes, and they don't have to draft the specific change, the specific language, but they can make a bullet point list of changes for the board to think about before it comes to council. And then they're more invested in and can assist with obtaining approval when that time comes. So I always like to include other owners and, uh, and, and uh, folks within the community because you're going to want their buy-in anyway, they have to vote to approve it. So the more people who you have on the board side, the better. Yeah. The other thing that I, I also recommend when you're dealing with this is before the board adopts the amendments and just sends them out to everyone to approve, assuming it's substantive amendments or larger amendments, have a town hall meeting. It's still going to be a board meeting that you have to notice, but have a town hall meeting for the membership to show up, ask their questions, raise concerns, because at that point, the board can still tweak the amendments. Once they've yeah. been mailed out to the members for approval, you can't change them unless you redo the whole mailing um, again. Yeah, it's a great point, Aaron. We, we see it a lot from the from property management side of things. You know, The more <clears> you <throat> can communicate with the residents and help them understand why it is the why behind what it is that the board is doing. So in this case, you know, amending the documents, 
um, you know, doing town halls, you know, putting it in the newsletter, trying to educate them, do like a, a one page sort of FAQ that answers, you know, the top questions about why are we doing these things? Why do we want to amend the documents? Um, the more information you can get out there, uh, the better. And, and I can tell you, we've done lots of document amendments and um, never really had an issue because we've handled it that way and people really appreciate it. it makes sense, right? It's kind right. of common sense. Um, right. And it's easier for them at the end of the day because there's nothing worse than trying to go through your documents, even from a, a manager's standpoint, and you see, you know, what was written originally, and then you've got to go find, you know, the 17 amendments over the last 20 years that have been done, and, and it's very confusing. So right. I had another um, question. They're asking about um, our documents are 20 years old. The property has been transferred from the developer. Can we simply eliminate all developer language? Yeah, we can go on to the next slide as well. Um, and this is one of the things I was going to talk about, um, it's, which, uh, you know, uh, we have folks who can see into the future. Um, <laughs> so when you're talking about amending the, de the declaration, the two-step amendment procedure is what I talked about, amending the amendment procedure first, um, or certain isolated amendments, consider amended and restated documents. And then, of course, you can eliminate obsolete references to the developer. Um, some associations, they want to eliminate any time where developer is referenced. It depends. There are certain things you want to leave in so you know the history and where things actually came from within the documents. But everything that's giving the developer voting rights, creating two classes of voting owners, um, requiring the developer to approve certain changes, all of that stuff can be removed in an amendment. And what you'll find is your amendment, your, your documents go from being very, very long to, to uh, much, much shorter. You see that a lot in articles of incorporation um, where you have the original developer um, uh, officers and directors, and none of that needs to be within your articles of incorporation moving forward. So we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so some amendments that you can consider, and I'll, I'll run through these, these lists, um, assessments pertaining to assessments and, and, and budgeting. Um, within amendments, you can add language that can maximize your right to recover from purchasers within foreclosures, um, making those folks who take a deed in lieu of foreclosure or purchase from the uh, lender at a foreclosure sale uh, jointly and severally responsible with all um, with all prior purchasers. There, there's um, there's been case law that's come out that. Um, has negatively impacted association's ability to collect if language in the declaration would conflict with the statute, such as the assessment obligation does not extend to subsequent purchasers unless assumed by them. Well, if you have that language in your docs and the lender forecloses and the third party purchases, they can point to this language and say, I'm not responsible for anything. I'm not even responsible for that safe harbor, that 12 months of past due assessments or 1% of the mortgage, whichever is less. And that, that's something that we work with our clients frequently on amending. Um, so superiority of the lien over second mortgages. Um, some older declarations say that the lien of any institutional mortgage is superior to the association. We can help to remove some of that language. Um, limits on budget increases, we can uh, add language in. Now within, um, and assessment increases, within chapter 718, there's already a uh, language that says no more than 15% um, uh, increase in the operating budget, but there's no limit within the statute for an HOA. So frequently what HOAs will do, they'll ask the question, well, why, why can't we limit our, our budget increases or owner, we're, we're concerned that a future board is going to uh, double or triple our assessments. And we frequently recommend, why don't you include the same language that you have within the condo statute, unless the, um, unless, uh, the owners um, vote to overturn it. So within condo, you can increase uh, up to 15% um, you, and you can increase beyond 15%, but then it could be subject to a vote of the owners. Um, limits on capital expenditures. Um, and um, that frequently is contained within, uh, within a lot of uh, HOA documents um, that we amend, where HOAs, a lot of times the Declaration of Covenants and Restrictions, it doesn't say anything about 
limiting the amount the association can spend on improvements. Um, HOAs don't have, we'll talk about this in a minute, but don't have the limitation on material alterations, improvements, or additions that condos do. So if a board comes in and decides they want to build a clubhouse and there's no limitation in the documents, then they could, they might be able to actually incur that expense to do so. Um, and that's where we're getting into the, the, the last bullet point, which is limitation of the ability to adopt special assessments for capital expenditures. We can include language such as that, that if you're going to spend over a certain dollar amount or a certain percentage of your budget on a capital expenditure within an HOA, then asking the membership for approval for special assessments is something that some of our clients have asked for and we've put into documents in the past. And Aaron, some of the questions that we're getting um, <clears throat> coming in are, are asking about how do we get the owner participation, you know, that we need. And if we don't get it, you know, on the first round, can it be extended, you know, for like a 90 yep. day period? Can you kind of talk us through that? Sure. So one of the things you do is don't schedule your meeting 14 days away from the date of mailing, because if you're asking owners to vote and return uh, proxies approving an amendment and you're giving them the bare minimum by statute, it's hard to get those back in, number one. Um, number two, if you go to a meeting and you need 50 proxies to amend um, and you only have 40, then what you should do is during the meeting announce that we, are, we haven't had enough owners um, participate at this point in time. You don't announce the vote or announce anything yet. But we are going to um, we're going to temporarily continue this meeting to another specific date and time. Um, Thirty days later, sixty days later, no more than ninety. Um, and if you do so, you can still use the proxies you have in hand for the future meeting. So, knowing that you may not have enough for that initial uh, meeting is okay. You can still reuse those proxies as long as you. Um, continue to the meeting to another specific date and time. Now, let's say the amendment fails, that people are up in arms about a specific issue and they want one word changed. And if one word changed, it would pass. There's no limitation unless your documents call for one, but there's no limitation that would prevent you from the day after the meeting, revising it and sending out a new date for another meeting. You can do that as many times as you want. Um, as much money as you have in your bank account for postage um, and, and, and copies. Um, so there's no limitation on that. Great. And we're getting some questions <coughs> too around um, how many changes are reasonable to tackle at one time. I, I can tell you everyone from a management standpoint, we always partner with the association's council and the committee if we're working with one on the board and, and try to wrap our arms around, okay, what like sort of group them into sections, what makes sense, what amendments do we think are going to be sort of the hot topics, yep. get all of that sort of out in the open with the residents via the town halls that we talked about earlier, so that as you go into the meeting, you have a pretty good, hopefully, idea of which way it's going right. to go and you can kind of kind of plan by working backwards, right? So as Aaron just said, you can do an extension of the meeting, et cetera. Um, we have to sort of organize it right up front. So you kind of have a strategic plan going in of, of how this is gonna work and not just you know fly fly blindly. I don't know if you have anything else to add on, on that, Aaron, from your end. Yeah, and, and it depends on the community. Um, you may have a, a community that you have 14, 15 amendments and everyone wants it to be easier to read. And with that kind of, um, uh, situation, you may want to do it amended and restated and just do everything at one time. Even if you're going to do everything at one time, you could still take a few sections that you know are going to be controversial, parking, leasing, pets. You may want to take items that you know are going to be controversial and carve those out and say, leasing will be a separate item on the proxy. We'll put all the, uh, everything will be in here. You vote for everything. But if you want the leasing restrictions, that's going to be item number two on the proxy. And you can break those things out. You just want to, in my experience, you want to make sure your proxy isn't two pages long with items one through 20, because then no one's going to vote for anything. But if there are a few controversial amendments that you want to break out, then then that's perfectly fine. And, and we, we do that for our clients all the time. Yeah. And um, electronic voting is also a great, a great way um, to try and get 
you know, some participation uh, as well and, and can make it easier, mm -hmm. um, I've right. seen from, from our end. We do have questions regarding cost, the million dollar question, right? So, uh, and I'll, give, I'll, give you, I'll give you the lawyer answer. It depends. Yes, it depends. <laughs> so, um, it depends. If, and it depends on a lot of different things. Um, if you're doing an amendment to your amendment procedure, it's going to be a few hundred dollars, really, because you're talking about I, I amending a limited provision, possibly the preparation of a proxy. And I'm just speaking about my firm and what we do. Um, if you're talking about a complete rewrite of your declaration, articles, and bylaws, what we do for our clients is we say, listen, we don't know how much it's going to cost until we know what you want us to do. So invest three, four, five hours for us to go through all of your documents, prepare a letter to you telling you, here are a bullet point list of all the things that we would recommend it, we would recommend changing um, and solicit thoughts from the association. Once we have reviewed your documents, then we can give you a ballpark estimate of what we think it may cost because we'll know what you're looking to change. We'll know what we recommend changing and we'll have gone through the documents. We see how long they are, how, um, how, how out of date they are, et cetera. Um, at that point, you can, we can have a better estimate for how much it's going to cost. But if you have the type of community where we're going to do our initial draft and then we're going to do drafts two through 17, it's going to go up um, with the time that's spent. Um, if, we're, if you want us to attend town hall meetings, answer questions from owners, it's just, it's an hourly project. Um, and, uh, and, and we're, we're pretty conservative with, with our time and how, and, and how we, we handled it. We're, we're not aggressive in, in our billing, but most of the time when clients come to us and they say, oh, well, we need to, we want to amend all of our documents and restate them all, get them all up to speed. Um, we, I, we have not had one that's, I don't believe we've had one that's been over 20 and we have not had one that's been below, you know, four to five. Um, that, that would be kind of, the, so it's a pretty big window, but, um, it, the window gets narrowed based on looking at the documents themselves. Yeah. Uh, and I would say too, um, again, from a management standpoint, working with the, the board and the committees and your attorney, we can really help you identify, you know, what is the low hanging fruit per se, and what is really, um, you know, a nice to have, but not necessarily, you know, need, um, we do have a question that came in specific to material alterations and it says, is there any reasonable logical definition of a material alteration for an HOA? So um, we'll talk about alterations and I will get to the HOA, the specific questions regarding a, an HOA. Um, the definition for alterations and material alterations within condominiums, um, we'll get to HOA in a minute, but Within chapter 718, the statute was amended a few years ago to say that unless your documents have a procedure for how this is going to, going to be handled, um, there's a vote to do a material alteration must take place before the work is done because of a lot of, a lot of associations were saying, well, we'll do it and then we'll come back and ask the owners after the fact if anyone raises a stink. Um, but the statute was amended to... Um, essentially uh, eliminate that, that kind of uh, loophole. But within chapter 718, it says you need 75% of all owners to approve any material alteration, which has been defined by, um, by Florida case law, arbitration opinions, as anything that changes the function, use, and appearance of the common elements. Installing a, another surveillance camera is a material alteration that changes the function, use, of appearance. Change, uh, changing the color of the pool cushions at the pool has been found to be a material alteration to the common elements. So we will frequently recommend that our clients change it from 75% of all to 75% of those owners that participate, as long as you have a quorum, and include a certain threshold for the board to spend without seeking owner approval. $10,000 is a number that, that we've used in the past or it could be a percentage of your budget. And that way, if the board wants to install another surveillance camera or wants to replace some furniture in the lobby, as long as it's not over that threshold, 
the board can do so without seeking the owner approval. Right, that's a great idea. I, I love that because there are some, definitely some day-to-day -day items for sure that right. you, know, you don't want to be bogged down in, in the minutia of trying to get a vote. So. Absolutely. Now, HOAs don't have those alteration provisions. Um, it does not exist within Chapter 720. The limitation would be something that would change the scheme of development within the community, such as you have a public park, and this was a case that came out a few years ago. You have a, a park within the community and the association builds a storage facility that takes over part of the park and only the HOA maintenance uh, employees can access that, that storage facility. That changes that sc the scheme of development. It changes the overall use of that parcel. So now the owners don't have use of that anymore. Um, so that would be something that would requ require a, a membership approval within an HOA, but there's no guidance within chapter 720. So you defer to your governing documents. And if your governing documents don't have language, then the board can make alterations. You can change a basketball court to a shuffleboard court. You can change the, the, the front signage. You can do a lot of different things. If you're looking for guidance as to what you should do as an HOA by way of amendment, if you want to be more like a condo where material alterations cannot happen, then you can add that similar language, material alteration, addition, or improvement that's within the condo statute. And the interpretation of that uh, will pull from the cases interpreting chapter 718. Um, so Aaron, we have a specific question. I'm assuming it's an HOA. It says, can you change bylaws to allow tennis courts to be converted to pickleball courts? Well, a lot of times, and maybe this question, and I'll apologize if this isn't the case, but a lot of times when folks are referring to bylaws, they're really lumping it together with the restrictions. Bylaws are typically your procedural documents, how you handle meetings, um, how you handle voting, how you handle budgeting, et cetera. Whereas your restrictions would have that kind of language. Um, with, if you're in an HOA and you're going to, you want to change, and this is the example that I just gave, and you want to change your, your basketball courts to a pickleball court or your tennis court to a pickleball court, um, unless there's language within your governing documents, generally speaking, you can do so. Um, so that, that's, that's the answer to, to that question. Um, and we can move on to the next slide. The next slide deals with maintenance issues. Um, it comes up within, within condos, it comes up within, within uh, HOAs as well. Um, within a condo, it's chapter 718 condo, you cannot change the boundaries of a unit without 100% vote of the owners. So if you have a condo declaration that says, the unit boundaries are the unfinished surface of the drywall in, you can't change it to be the whole portion of the drywall without 100% of the unit owner vote. However, within a condo, through an amendment, you can label common elements as limited common elements, such as you have a balcony. Typically, balcony uh, would be a limited common element. It's a, it's a common element that's reserved for the exclusive use of a specific owner or owners. And you can then have the individual owner be responsible for maintenance of certain limited common elements. And that's something that you can address within amendments to the documents. Um, this is frequently an issue within townhomes and townhomes have some of the most complicated and, and difficult issues to deal with because you're not a condo, you're not an HOA, but you have shared walls, shared roofs, um, and you have to figure out how you're gonna deal with the maintenance items. And typically you'll see a maintenance provision in a condo, I mean, in a townhome community, that is a long paragraph, incredibly difficult to read and no one can make heads or tails of what they're responsible for. I'm so glad we, it's not just me. <laughs> yeah, so we will go in and we will break everything out in bullet points. What does the association currently do? What do you wanna continue doing? What do you want owners to be responsible for on their own lot and help guide how that's going to be broken out. Um, on this slide, we're talking about loss reduction and allocation issues, opt out for condo associations. What I mean by this is frequently we will amend documents. I, I apologize if anyone is within a condo 
um, a high rise where you have had water pouring on you from above. Um, I think that's almost a rite of passage in a condo these days, where if you don't have a flood in your unit, then you haven't lived in a condo long enough. But one of the things that we include within amendments frequently, especially within condo buildings where folks are stacked on top of one another is, if you're going to be out of your unit for more than 72 hours, seven days, whatever the association wants to include, you have an affirmative obligation to turn off water to your unit. And you have an affirmative obligation to check your appliance hoses and to inspect your water heater. And do people necessarily do that? No. However, if there is a leak above and someone is out of the unit for 30 days and the question is asked, did you shut off water? No. Our documents require that you shut off water. You breach the provisions of our documents and as a result of you breaching our documents, there's been damage as a result. So the failure to turn off the water then becomes evidence of that owner's negligence. And that's helpful not necessarily from getting folks to do it, although hopefully it does encourage them to do it, but it more serves as a basis to go after the owner and say, you're responsible not just for the damage to, to your the items within your unit, but you're also gonna be responsible uh, for all the damage to the common elements because you were negligent. Um, and, and that's proved to be helpful over time. Um, we can go to the next slide. Another item. Um, Floor coverings, uh, soundproofing in condo units. A lot of times you don't have language within your declaration regarding how you're going to handle soundproofing. However, it becomes a frequent problem um, within condos where you don't have that language or you have an older building. You may want to amend your documents to have specific language that says where you can have certain types of floor covering. If you're going to put carpet, carpet can only be here. If you're gonna do hardwood or tile, it needs to be here. If you wanna do hardwood or tile throughout, <clears throat> then you have to put in soundproofing or sound dampening material, and you can have an engineer put together specs to either include in your rules and regulations, <coughs> excuse me, or to um, put within the declaration itself. So that way, when folks are coming to you to seek approval for changing the floor coverings, you can have specific language in your documents that says, this is what you need to do. And you need to provide proof to us, such as information from your contractor, et cetera, that this is what you're gonna, what you're gonna be including when you refinish the floor or renovate the unit. Aaron, we had a couple of questions come in asking about, is there sort of um like a top five or a, you know, a top few things that you generally see that most communities want to change in their documents? And before you answer that, there's also questions regarding uh, what about the use of drones with you know, times changing? Are you seeing that at all, adding something into the documents? Sure, the, the top five, I will say parking, leasing and pets is, are, are, are big. Um, they're the three things that cause the most consternation within communities. Um, those would be the top three. The, the, the other items would deal with um, insurance provisions, eliminating obsolete provisions within insurance and bringing it up to date um, and, and maintenance obligations really. Um, because a lot of old developer documents, they're unclear when it comes to unit boundaries within a condo. Um, and that's something that we can, uh, we can help. As far as drones, we have seen a few issues pertaining to drones. Um, uh, we've helped associations draft rules and regulations prohibiting the use of drones within communities um, from the standpoint of, uh, especially within condos, they're, anytime they're operating a drone, they're operating it on the common elements or above the common elements. Um, they're operating it outside of their unit. Um, so we have assisted associations with drafting rules in connection with that. If you're going, if you're in an HOA and you have your own lot, use of items within your lot, you can also draft rules to restrict um, restrict uh, drone usage. Um, uh, but we haven't dealt with that a whole lot yet. Um, yeah. But you, but you deal with a whole wide variety of issues, such as invasion of privacy and everything else. Most people that are flying drones are not going up and down right above their own lot. They're taking it around the community. 
Um, so those are things that uh, you can definitely look to restrict or limit either through rules or, or, or declaration amendments. Great, fantastic. I know we've got a few more slides to do, so I'm gonna hold on my questions and let you kind of get through those and then we can kind sure. of talk through the questions. Okay, um, insurance. So um, insurance, reviewing your insurance requirements are really important. You'll, in some older documents, you'll see the insurance trustee. If you have an insurance claim, it's gonna be referred to the insurance trustee. <clears throat> They're gonna to have to handle and, uh, and deal with the, the, um, the claim and then they'll be the one who disperses proceeds. No one serves as an insurance trustee anymore. It's incredibly expensive. Um, most of the time you have man between management and board, they are handling the claim along with uh, the assistance of counsel. So we remove language pertaining to that. Uh, going back to townhomes, if you're in a townhome community, a lot of times people will purchase condo insurance within a townhome. So we include language to say that you need to purchase insurance, single family home insurance for your townhome community <clears throat> uh, for the individual lots because the lot is from the lot line to the lot line. It's the entire improvement constructed on the lot if you're a chapter 720 townhome community. Um, so making sure you don't have gaps in coverage are incredibly important. And we help with, uh, with those kind of amendments. So we can move to the next slide. So on the next slide, we'll talk about sales and leasing. We have the next slide. Hold on one second, guys. I think Laura got disconnected. Let me pull it up. All right, I'll talk while we're waiting for it to come up. Um, so from sales and leasing perspective, frequently associations are dealing with <clears throat> are dealing with wanting to do background checks on folks when they come with uh, into the community, either through purchase or for or for lease. We, um, we can draft approval rights for sales and purchases. Rights of first refusal um, aren't used as commonly, but you'll see them in documents. Grounds to disapprove. It's really important if you're going to deny someone the right to lease their property or to sell their property that you have specifically identified grounds for disapproval, not just anyone with a felony, because that, uh, according to the housing Department of Housing and Urban Development, could have an unintended but adverse discriminatory um, impact on minorities. And that was something that came out a few years ago uh, in a guidance memorandum from HUD. So it's really important to carefully tailor uh, your amendments when you're dealing with um, approval approval rights. There's a couple uh, of questions, Aaron, regarding that about, you know, can we add um, the requirement for background checks to our documents with specific uh, credit scores? So, yes, um, you can. We don't typically recommend credit scores. Uh, or checking for credit scores. I know that some communities do for um, both sales and leases. I think if you're going to do it in connection with sales and you have specific uh, language within your documents that requires that, and um, then that is okay. It is okay to do. For leasing, we don't recommend you deal or deal with or look at credit scores at all because the tenant's ability to pay has no bearing on the owner's obligation to pay. So the tenant paying the owner is, 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 is really kind of irrelevant. Um, and when you're dealing with, uh, with credit scores and, 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 uh, and denials, you have to comply with the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, which can raise a whole other um, uh, round of issues that the association has to deal with. But yes, the short answer is you can amend to require background checks and to charge a fee for conducting such background checks. You just need to make sure that your grounds for denial are clear um, within your documents. Um, with condos, there are certain um, there are certain amendments that you can't make with sales and leases, such as the ability to lease or the duration of the of the lease term that would affect as existing owners. So, if you wanted to prohibit any short term rental in your condo today, you you can it would only apply to owners that sign the proxy and consent and future owners. Any existing owners that are renting on Airbnb, you're not gonna be able to prohibit them from doing so if they have the right to do so now. Um, we put in waiting periods and restrictions on owning multiple units. So a waiting period 
you purchase a unit, you have to wait a year or two years before you're eligible to rent. That's helpful when you have communities that want to discourage investor owners. Um, and then also providing a lease addendum uh, requirement that would obligate both the owner, the association, and the renter to sign an addendum to the lease agreement where the tenant is agreeing to abide by the terms of the governing documents and essentially permits the association to take action to evict the, uh, the tenant if necessary um, should the tenant violate the documents. Um, typically, we recommend that the owner take action to evict the tenant on their own, um, but having the lease addendum where the association becomes a party to a portion of that relationship uh, may uh, give the association the right to pursue uh, eviction as the, as the owner would. Move on to the next slide. Aaron, you touched base. We had a couple of questions regarding sort of the how the grandfathering works. Can you just touch base? You just mentioned it quickly there. I think they're just looking for clarification. So if you do an amendment to the documents that um, puts more restrictions in, that's only going to apply to new new purchasers or how, how, where is that line in the sand? Yeah, I mentioned that with respect to sales and leases within condos. Yeah. If, if you have... And you have to think about how you can get it adopted too, right? So if you have a lot of people in your community that are currently that currently have pets or currently are engaged in short-term rentals, they're not going to agree um, to support an amendment if it's going to negatively impact them. Yeah. So it's really a case-by-case -case basis, <clears throat> except for the limited grounds within Chapter 718 that the association can uh, cannot amend unless the owner consents. Um, dealing with sales and leases. But if you want to amend documents to further restrict the use rights of owners, you can do so. Um, <clears throat> but it's a case by case basis as to how much you want to grandfather in. So let's say you want to adopt a pet rule or a pet new pet restriction, limiting dogs to no more than 25 pounds, but you have people who have dogs that are larger within the community currently. You include language within the restriction that says, this will not apply to any owners or to any animals currently on the property that are in violation of this new language. However, the owners will be required to provide notice within 15 days, 30 days of this animal. And when that animal um, uh, passes on, then that owner will not be allowed to replace that animal with an animal that exceeds the weight restrictions. So that's the kind of thing that it's really a case by case basis based on how you wanna work things within the community. Right. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying. So finding and enforcement provisions. So if you follow the very specific finding procedures, and I'm not going to go into these in detail, um, you can find without the specific authority in your documents, both in chapter 720, um, 7, uh, 718, and 719, there's specific language regarding finding for violation of the documents. If you're in a condo, it's $100 a day for continuing violation um, up to $1,000 and that's where it's capped. Within an HOA, you can adopt larger fines. If you want to find someone $250 for certain violations, you can. And if you want to specifically say in your HOA documents that once you get over $1,000 in fines, they can be lienable as an assessment, you can do so in an HOA, not in a condo. Um, condos can't lien for fines, but you can collect uh, by a small claims court or, or other, other avenues. Typically it comes up when a condo owner tries to sell their property and they get in a, a, a payoff letter and it has the non-leanable expenses on there as well. Um, and this is, uh, it, it's, it's not part of the amendment process, but owners are also liable for the actions of their tenants, guests, invitees, and that's by statute. We can include that language in your documents, but absent Inclusion, it's, it's set forth within the governing law um, in Florida statutes. Pets, um, you can include all the weight, height, number of pets, exclusion of birds and fish, and you can also ban dangerous and, 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 and aggressive breeds um, within your community. Um, that's something that frequently um, is done. Um, next slide. Parking and permitted vehicles. Um, we frequently deal with this what is considered a commercial vehicle, what's considered a truck. It should be defined not just by, is it a truck or is it a, a used uh, for, uh, for business purposes, but what does it look like on the outside? 
is it the truck that has, is it the, the van that has the ladders on top that, that a plumber may, a uh, plumber or electrician, you know, a contractor is going to typically have, um, is it a truck, a, a massive truck with four wheels, you know, in the back, um, um, you know, that can tow more than a ton. Does it take up more than one space? There are things that you can draft into your documents based on your, your, uh, your need within the community. Um, if you have parking spaces and you're in a condo and your declaration says parking spaces are limited common element, <clears throat> you can't assign them and trade them with other people unless the declaration specifically provides for that. Um, if you are going to, or also, if you're going to say that you, trucks and commercial vehicles are prohibited and you want to eliminate motorcycles, scooters, RVs, boats, all of those things should be specified within the terms of the use restriction. Um, similarly, boats and RVs. Are you going to allow a boat or RV to be pulled into the community or driven in the community <clears throat> um, for purposes of loading and unloading? If you say it's prohibited in the community at all times and someone can't even bring in an RV technically to load up overnight and then to leave. So that's something else you wanna specify. We can go to the next slide. <coughs> architectural control provisions. If you're in an HOA and you have an architectural control committee that has the power to approve, do not handle this by email consensus every time an application comes in. The ARC, the ACC, the DRC, whatever comp, uh, you know, compilation of letters makes up your architectural control committee, you need to handle it in the same manner as a board meeting. You need to post notice, just as you would for a board meeting. It needs to be open for the membership and the committee needs to meet and make its determination. The reason for that is the neighbors wanna know what's going next door and wanna be able to speak about what's going next door, not just that it complies with the specific guidelines you have in place, but its impact on other people. So the committee needs to uh, needs to meet as part of a properly noticed committee meeting. And typically, we would see that on a on a monthly basis. Is that what you're seeing in your practice that they would meet monthly or bi monthly? It depends on the documents. If you have to respond within 15 days or it's deemed approved, then you better meet more frequently than monthly. Um, if it's 30 days, then monthly is generally fine. It depends, but I, I frequently recommend that boards be very careful with authority provided to committees. <clears throat> and if you have a rogue committee member, unless your documents don't allow the board to remove committee members, the board, if you have a rogue ARC committee member, the board should remove them and replace them with somebody who's gonna follow the documents and follow the law. Because when you get a complaint or demand letter, the board's gonna be the one who's gonna have to deal with it, not the ARC committee. So a lot of my communities, when they have art committees where it says the art committee shall be a committee of this many people, and if it hasn't been formed, it's the board. A lot of my communities, the board serves as the art committee as well, because they are the ones who um, are going to ultimately have to answer for any decisions that the art committee gives. We have a, a question, Aaron, that's come in from an association. It looks like they are um, currently under developer control and getting ready to turn over. And, and their question is, the, it sounds like the developer is willing to um, you know, make some changes to the documents prior to turnover. Do you have any thoughts on where that line in the sand should be drawn as far as what changes the developer should make versus waiting until the new board takes control and then going through this you know, process? It depends on what the documents say. A lot of documents give the developer the ability to amend documents prior to turnover. And as long as the developer is not violating the terms of, of the declaration, and there are certain provisions that you cannot include in governing documents that developer cannot include. But if the governing documents permit the developer to make changes, then they're permitted to make changes. Um, once it turns over, if they've made changes that are not acceptable, the, the association can get involved and change it back if they want. Um, but that's, that's, that's something that, uh, that is a case by case, uh, analysis that would have to be undertaken with the documents in question. Now, we have another, uh, a question that came in, I know we're going to run it. We've got lots of questions. We might run out of time. We're actually, we will run out of time, but this one's regarding, uh, smoking, um, inside condo units, um, specifically, 
and they're saying that they uh, have a ban on smoking in common areas and have designated three outside spaces for smokers to use. Mm -hmm. However, owners are now complaining of marijuana smell, smell, uh, you know, wafting into the hallways from their own unit and trying to put a, a rule around that. Any thoughts on that one? Yeah, this is a very, um, a very hot issue around the country right now. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's another one of those situations where I'll give you the 30,000 foot, but it's really discuss with your own counsel and see the best way to handle it <clears throat> because there are a lot of things that come up. Does this person have a disability related need for, for this, uh, for, for the product, for, for marijuana? And if they do, and you prohibit them from any kind of smoking within their unit, are they entitled to a reasonable accommodation? And what would be a reasonable accommodation? Allowing them to smoke within their unit, but maybe allowing them, requiring them to use smokeless, uh, you know, smokeless ashtrays, or taking other steps to ensure it doesn't waft into the, uh, it doesn't waft into the hallway, or requesting that they do so on their balcony if they have a balcony. Um, there are things that you can look into, but you have to analyze and make that determination. Some lawyers in, in other parts of the country have said, well, can't you grant them an accommodation and, or deny their accommodation and say that they can uh, utilize an edible product because that could give them the same result. Um, but then you're getting into what their doctor has prescribed for them and does it have the same impact and you want to be real careful when you're dealing with those issues. When we're talking about cigarette smoke, it's a lot different. Um, you can place a lot of restrictions on folks. <coughs> um, and if it becomes a significant problem within a unit, um, there are steps that you can take to help and reduce the transmission through walls or through doors, um, et cetera. Um, so back to the slides, we're talking about clear authority for rules and regulations. Um, you want to make sure within your, your documents, sometimes it says that the owners have to approve changes to any rules and regulations. Sometimes it's buried in the powers of a board of directors within the Articles of Incorporation. And if it is, you may want to amend that out to give the board the power to amend rules and regulations. And if you're concerned about the, bo the board being overzealous, you can, of course, include language that says, However, a majority of owners participating in a meeting or signing a petition can overturn a, a board adopted rule. You can put language in there uh, to that effect that would still give the owners power on the back end, but not requiring them to approve any rule that's adopted. Next slide. And we talked about this briefly, and I know we're dealing with, uh, with, um, with some time issues, but housing for, for older persons, age restrictions, one of the things you wanna make sure of when you're dealing with, if you're gonna amend and say, we wanna be a 55 and older community, you can, but there are very specific statutory procedures you need to follow. Um, and you need to discuss with uh, council those specific procedures. You can go to the next slide. Um, HOA issues. Um, 72303 is, a, is difficult for a lot of HOAs to interpret and implement. And this is uh, the specific pr provision dealing with statutory reserves. Sometimes you have mandatory reserves established by the developer. If you do, you need to make sure that you are accounting for them um, every year. If you don't, you don't necessarily have to, but including language within your documents about budgets, about special assessments, about elections is really important within HOAs, it says the elections are be, to be conducted in the manner set forth in the governing documents. Okay. Well, if, you're, if you look at your bylaws that were drafted in the 60s, and they say you're to meet at high noon on the tennis court and play rock, paper, scissors, and the winner is on the board, that's how you do it. You can't say, well, condos have it so easy, and we're just going to do the two notice, two envelope system, because <clears throat> that's how we've been doing it for decades. That's fine until it's not fine. All it takes is one owner to raise an issue. So we frequently get involved with our HOAs and helping them to amend their bylaws to um, deal with uh, elections, voting certificates, entitlement to vote, et cetera. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, the, the, the other thing I'll, I'll comment on, it was on the prior slide, um, I know there was a question about it, it, was business use of homes. Now, 
I don't know of any person in any community that has not done work in their home. Um, I'm sure most people um, right now, including myself, I'm in my home office, um, are on Zoom, which is this using your home for business purposes? Sure. Um, if you're looking at it very strictly. So we'll help draft amendments that say any business use is okay as long as you don't see increased foot traffic, commercial purposes, and, and, and things along those lines. So if you have people showing up um, for doctor's appointments at someone's home and it's a constant flow, that's something where you would see an increased amount of foot traffic where it's not just a, a job that you're handling from within your own unit or from within your own, uh, your, your own home. So that's something that we'll help with. Um, so we talked about election procedures. Um, okay, consider electronic. So one of the things that we're talking to our clients a lot about now is what happens when everyone goes back to the world and you're not on Zoom anymore. Um, I know a lot of people have Zoom fatigue at this point. Board meetings on Zoom, I'm speaking to all the board members out there, um, but Zoom, uh, board meetings on Zoom have been somewhat refreshing. I haven't had to ask a question such as, are you going to have an unruly owner that shows up um, where we need to call off-duty law enforcement? Because you are your own law enforcement. There's a magical mute button that has worked out so well for so many people for the past 10 months. So one of the things that we're including in bylaw amendments now is the board as long as everyone has the ability to participate virtually as they would as if they were present, such as by Zoom, the board, if it deems it desirable, can hold a board meeting uh, by Zoom and in this format. And our clients like that um, because the statute doesn't specifically address it. But I imagine that legislative changes, if not this year, next year will um, because it's been uh, nice for a lot more people to be able to participate um, in meetings. Yeah, we've had really positive response uh, with the board meetings and annual meetings with people mm -hmm. being able to participate that in the past hadn't been able to. So I think it's definitely a positive. Yeah. Okay, we can go to the next one. Okay, rules and regulations. We've touched on these uh, throughout. Um, for HOAs, it's really important that you, once they're adopted, the law now requires you to record notice of the rules in the public records. And the reason the law requires it is not because the legislature decided to make a, a change. It said rules and regulations must be recorded, but they changed the definition of governing documents of an HOA to include rules and regulations. And then they say governing documents have to be recorded. So as a result, now anytime the board in an HOA adopts rules, you have to record them. It's not the same within a condo. Um, and this is a slide that just it goes through a lot of other things that we've talked about, such as satellite dishes, vehicles, um, uh, owner participation in meeting, inspection and copying of records. All of these items are great things that you can incorporate into board made rules. I'll give you a great example of um, official records inspections. If you're a board member and I'll ask for a show of hands and I'll assume everyone is going to raise their hands because I can't see any of you. Um, that how many of you have received that 3 a.m. rambling email from an owner uh, complaining about everything and buried somewhere within there is, I wanna see the meeting minutes. <clears throat> Everyone. So, or something along those lines. Unless you have rules and regulations governing official records inspection requests that require someone to make them by certified mail return receipt requested to the registered agent or another specific procedure, Buried within that email that you can measure in inches, not paragraphs, or sometimes feet, is an official records inspection request. So you're required to make that record available or records available within 10 business days. If you don't do so, it's a violation of Chapter 718 or Chapter 720. So adopting rules regarding official records inspection requests, great idea. In condos, HOAs, you don't have to respond to owners. In condos, if an owner sends a certified mail list of questions, you have to respond within 30 days unless you've adopted rules regarding how many questions you have to respond to from each owner and the frequency of the request and the manner of the request, et cetera. So I have some clients that have owners that have sent 30 questions with subparts. Here's all, and you have to answer within 30 days unless you've adopted rules. 
fortunately for this client, <clears throat> they adopted rules that required them to respond to one question, including subparts in every 30 day period. So it took about 18 months to respond to this owner's one written inquiry. And we told them that we'll respond once every 30 days. Here's the information, here's the information. Because when you have those owners, as a lot of you know, they divert time and resources from things that are really important for sometimes, sometimes it's, it's meaningful items, but a lot of times it's their own personal or gender or gripes. So it's a way to help conserve the most valuable resource you as volunteer board members have is time. And the same thing for property managers. Um, and that's, that can be accomplished through adoption of rules and regulations. Yeah, it's a great point. And we do see that from the management end. Where <clears throat> we occasionally we'll get, you know, that those one or two homeowners. So that's a, a great suggestion. Definitely speak with your management company and your association council to try and um, get those implemented if you haven't already. Yep. And Aaron, we have gone over our time. Is there anything um, from a uh, from your end that you definitely want to cover that we haven't covered? And then I'll try what, to wrap what? up a few questions. Yeah, one last time, and, and I'm here for, for everyone who's on the call. So if people want to drop off, they can, but I'm happy to answer questions uh, unless uh, unless uh, there's a hard and fast uh, time timeline. But um, the last thing, and this is important, very important for an HOA, keep your governing documents from expiring. If you're a Chapter 720 association, you need to, when we get off this call, look at your documents and see when your declaration, the original declaration was recorded. If it was recorded more than 30 years ago and you have not taken action to preserve it under chapter 718, I, I mean, under chapter 720 rather, then you need to call your attorney this afternoon. Um, and the reason, uh, well, and provided it's that deadline is approaching or if it's already expired, you really need to expedite it. Because if your documents are more than 30 years old and you haven't taken steps to preserve them, then they're expired. You can't force use restrictions, you can't collect assessments, all of that. There are steps you can take by statute to revitalize them and it's a very specific procedure to follow. Um, if you are rapidly approaching that 30 year date, contact counsel and have that conversation. If you're at year 20, year 15, year 25, you're fine. Um, but uh, keep that on the on on your uh, on your back burner, and definitely communicate with council and management about it, so you don't let that date slip by. Um, and with that, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to answer any other questions, Fiona. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks for being so generous with your time. We really appreciate it. Um, we do have some, and I'm, I'll try to bunch them up together so we don't uh, double up here. Um, one is: Can fireworks be prohibited in an HOA? So the Statutes were recently amended <clears throat> uh, to permit fireworks, but just like you can have zoning uh, that um, permit chickens within a community, the association's restrictions can be more restrictive. So you can um, take action to prohibit fireworks within an HOA as long as your documents prohibit that. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, and then we've got one that says, um, why can't votes be done electronically instead of U.S. mail? Well, and, and this will largely depend on, are you a 718 condo? Or are you a Chapter 720 HOA? Um, you can vote electronically if the association has put a procedure in place to permit electronic voting. If you haven't, then it would need to be done by mail. Um, or if it's just a proxy, a proxy can be emailed. You can take a picture and text a picture of the proxy to the property management. But if you're talking about a ballot in a, um, uh, in a condo that needs to be a secret ballot with a two envelope system, that's what the law requires. And that's a mandatory statute, not permissive. Um, let's see, this one says, we just had a rewrite of our documents. Uh, the lawyer said this makes it easier to understand, but in a court of law, the original and amendments would still be used. Is so in this that, true? Please explain. So in that situation, you probably had someone consolidate all of your documents into one Word document, but you did not necessarily adopt an amended and restated set of documents. So it's a good reference guide. However, 
in if you go to court, if you haven't had a um, an amended and restated set of documents or consolidated declaration approved, then you would utilize the prior documents. Okay, perfect. Okay, here's a confusing one. Stay with me. <laughs> it says we have two units that have been combined into one unit. They are still shown as two units in the documents as well as the county property tax records. However, we have a joint unit that is shown as one unit in the docs, but two units in the property tax records. Could we amend the condo docs to agree with the county, county property tax records? Well, when you, have, when you have a condo and you look at your plat and your plat says, this is how many units and it shows the floor of the building and it shows this is the unit or this is the, or this, these are the unit boundaries. If it shows one unit, um, and an owner purchase both units and combine them, it's still two units for purposes of assessments, voting, et cetera. If you have one unit that is part of the original platted declaration, but for some reason the county is showing it as two, it may be an error with the county tax records, but you can't deviate from what the original declaration says because you cannot change how owners share in the payment of assessments. And if you change the number of units within the community, you're changing the percentage by which everyone shares in the payment of assessments, which you can't do. Right, great explanation. You made that super simple. Thank you. I thought that was gonna be a difficult one, but you made it very ah, easy. Come on. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. I'm just scrolling down. Bear with me one second. Um, Uh, okay, are you allowed as an HOA to have a percentage limit on units within the HOA that can actually be rental units? Yes, you are, as long as you have it clearly set forth in your, in your governing documents. You can create a rental cap, a leasing cap, um, and how it would work is you would say, we're not going to allow more than 15% of rentals to be rented. I mean, 15% of homes to be rented, and once we reach the 15% limit, then anyone who wants to rent will go on a waiting list. <clears throat> and you can include detailed procedures and you should include detailed procedures for how the waiting list is going to operate to make it fair for everyone within the community. Okay, great. And then we've got a question that says, to what extent can the board promulgated rules and regs be used to avoid dealing with issues through more formal amendment requirements? So it sounds like he's saying, can we just make up rules and regs versus amending the documents? If it does not conflict with the declaration articles or bylaws, generally speaking, you can. However, if there are going to be controversial matters, um, you need to have, you, I will strongly recommend you have owners approve them. Um, and Declaration amendments have a presumption of validity, whereas rules, you have to look at what's reasonable. So if you have nothing within your documents about ability to lease, and you want to, by board-made rule, prohibit all rentals, I would not recommend that. It's probably not going to be found to be valid um, as a board-made rule because it may not be considered reasonable, um, and, you, and, and you may not get away with that. So if there are things that are going to directly um, and potentially negatively impact your membership, then you should seek membership approval um, for those items. We've got a question asking about board meeting minutes. Any guidance on how much detail should be in our board meeting minutes for an they, HOA? They, they should at least be four and a half pages long. I'm, I'm kidding. Um, board... <laughs> I'm going to mute you, Aaron. <laughs> oh, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, board meeting minutes, they need to say who's there. Um, they need to show the time it started, the time it ended. It needs to, it can have the agenda on it and it should, uh, detail any motions that were made, who made them, who seconded them and the vote on those motions. All of the back and forth discussion is extra and does not need to be included in meeting minutes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, in our condo association, should we require owners to maintain and provide proof of current insurance liability policies? Um, yeah, I mean, if, and if you don't have the individual owner's obligation to insure, 
then you should, you can amend the insurance provision within uh, the declaration to require that and to require providing proof of coverage. And that's something we frequently do. Okay. And then we've got a, a question from a condo. I think there might be a little bit of confusion here. It says you refer to rules and regulations and most people lump them together. How do you recommend adopting a regulation? Can you give an example of the proper process for adopting a regulation in a condo versus, I think they're saying, is there a difference between a regulation and a rule? Nope, statute talks about rules and regulations. So we lump them together as rules and regulations too. Yeah, same thing, okay. Um, let's see, bear with me one second here. We live in a co-op and we wish to sell the former manager's unit. Is there any change in documents that would allow us to sell the, the unit without a hundred percent agreement from the owners? It would depend on the, on the, on the governing okay. documents. They, yeah. yeah. That's something I would speak to their current attorney about. Okay. Um, we've got a question regarding, we're currently a HOA with no age restrictions. And what is the process to propose a change to a 55 plus community? That's not easily done. Yeah, it's not easily done. Um, you need to, number one, adopt amendments. And there's going to be specific procedure you're going to need to follow within the HOA. Um, so, and, and depending on, are you going to be 65 and older, 55 and older? Um, there are thresholds for how many people below uh, the age uh, limitation can be living within the community for you to qualify for housing for older persons. So that's something that it would be a whole other topic for another day. But yeah, yeah, it would involve not only an amendment, but essentially a survey and analysis of who's within the community. Okay. And then last couple of questions. We had a couple of questions regarding going back to the ARC uh, yeah. committee meetings. And I think what they're asking is, um, is the recommendation that they're always treated like board meetings, always yes. open to the public, even when they're doing things like painting the exterior of the home or doing interior modeling? I think your point was um, the neighbors want to know what's going on in, in the community. If, if your governing documents require the ARC to approve, the ARC cannot approve without having a meeting because the ARC technically can't meet without Having a meeting and, and having a meeting, yeah. And on that note, a question we often get, so maybe you could speak to it, is do our committee meetings have to be noticed like a board meeting, whether it's a condo or an HOA? There's language within the statute that talks about whether they have to be noticed um, and that you can amend your documents to limit which committee, which committee meetings would need to be um, open. So if you have a committee that's making a final determination on behalf of the board, or that's considering the budget, those need to be open. But if you have a social committee, <clears throat> you can amend your documents so that would not need to be open to the public. Um, or a rule uh, revision committee, you can amend your documents so that would not need to be open to the public. <clears throat> but if your ARC is approving or denying changes, that would need to be open to the community regardless of the amendment. Okay, fantastic. We'll take a couple of more questions here. I'm trying to get the ones that kind of cover uh, more than just one person's question. Um, we've got a, a question that says, what happens if the master association for a group of buildings changes access to the community building to an access card and requires each owner to pay for the card. So it sounds like they've maybe instituted a new um, access system where you've got to pay for the FOB perhaps. Yeah, you, you need to talk to your council about looking at the language within the master documents, the sub association documents and see whether that's permitted. Um, it, it's, it, that would not be just something I'd be able to answer off the cuff. I don't think it's outright prohibited because things like this happen all the time. Um, it would depend on your documents. Okay. And then last one, um, if you can speak to the need for a finding committee. So we seem to have hit a, hit a vein. Maybe we should do a, another, a webinar on committees. <laughs> so if but. you want, if you want to find someone, an association, and this is frequently um, uh, handled improperly. Um, but if you have, if you want to find an owner for a violation of the documents, there's a very specific statutory procedure that you have to follow. 
and it cannot be done until a finding committee has met at a properly noticed meeting open to the membership. The finding committee's role at that meeting is to determine whether to confirm or reject a fine that's been levied by the board. You have to have a finding committee meeting before a fine can will become due from an owner. The statute for in chapter 718 and chapter 720 um, specifically says that the finding committee's role is to determine whether to confirm or reject the fine. So the board levies the fine, $100 a day, sends Fiona a letter saying you're in violation. Um, you will ha you have a meeting set before the finding committee at least 14 days from the date of the letter where you can show up and argue your case. At that meeting, the finding committee will either confirm or reject the fine. If they confirm it, it's due within five days. If they reject it, it's not due at all. Um, a lot of associations will say, well, we'll provide a notice to the owner telling the owner you have a right to request a, he a, a hearing before the finding committee. That's not appropriate. The finding committee has to actually confirm the fine and they cannot confirm the fine unless they have a meeting. So a lot of associations that want to implement a finding committee will impanel the finding committee and then schedule the, um, the finding committee meetings either twice a month or once a month on a specific date and they'll handle it where it would come up within the rotation based on the notice provisions. Yeah, and that is for sure the, the best way to do it. Well, Aaron, this has been great. Thank you so much for My being pleasure. so generous with, with your time and your wealth of knowledge. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, I think based on the questions we got today, we'll definitely uh, schedule maybe uh, we'll take a look at what topics we didn't get to dive into today to today where there's interest and we'll uh, we'll get another one of these going in uh, maybe next month. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and I hope everyone who's still on the call uh, got a lot out of it. Um, and thanks uh, Fiona to, uh, to, to you and your team and hope everyone enjoys the rest of their week. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. We really appreciate your time and uh, feel free to submit your questions. Um, all of the information is there on the screen. If we didn't get to you, we'll circle back with you. You can always reach out to info at castlegroup.com and we can follow up with you from there and, and forward information on to Aaron as well. So have a great day. Stay safe out there, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.